Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Um, very good morning. Okay, I'm. My name is Adiba Sharifato Adiba, and I am from Sisters in Islam in Malaysia, um, the women's rights organization in Malaysia. So um, today, uh, what I would like to share is the experiences of women. And uh, my presentation is mostly from the activist lens because I myself an activist. I'm not um, an academic, so so I will take you through throughout my presentation. Um, my presentation today uh, title is religious conservatism and the impacts on Muslim women's rights in Malaysia. So uh, let me share the background. Uh, maybe some of you have been to Malaysia, some are not, but um, basically Malaysia, uh, the current population of Malaysia is 32 million. Uh, this is based on the data that we get in 2021. And uh, Malaysia comprise of 13 states with one federal territory. So basically uh, Malaysia has two areas, the peninsula Malaysia, we call it West Malaysia and also the East Malaysia which is Sabah and Sarawak and the Borneo part. And the population is diverse and mixed with um, ethnic Malays and indigenous from, from the biggest group. I mean, I am Malay myself, followed by Chinese, Indian and others. So um, basically when, when they say Malaysia is truly Asia, yes, Malaysia is a mixture of Asian people. And Islam is the official religion, but other religions are free to be practiced. Um, Muslim in Malaysia form the biggest population, uh, which is about 60% of the population. And majority Muslim in Malaysia are the followers of Sunni, and they uh, observe Shafi'i Mazhab diligently. And Malaysia runs dual legal system. Uh, we have civil and sharia law. Uh, civil law applies to all citizens, whether you are Muslim and non-Muslim. But Sharia law only applies for Muslim, only on the area of family law and uh, Sharia criminal law as well. <coughs> and what is the social political situation now in Malaysia? Uh, I know that um, some of our government official they proudly share that Malaysia is a moderate. Muslim country, but is it true? Um, so the political, social political situation now uh, is um, we have the the biggest reformation in our politics after the general election in 2018, where the opposition won big at that time. So um, Mahathir Mohamad became the second term uh, prime minister at that time but it was only lasted for 22 months. And again, because of the political instability started in February 2020, when members of the parliament tried to shift their support to other political party, um, it has led to the collapse of the government. Basically, uh, now, um, it is the first time uh, Malaysian Islamic Party, we call it PAS, uh, being part of the ruling government now. Um, now what we have is the conservative Islamist government, what I can say. And from um, 2020, when the pandemic started, um, some of the government officials or the minister in the cabinet uh, has resorted to heavy-handed tactics, investigating and then uh, arresting people, those who are critical to the government policies as well. And um, how, how, how Malaysia has now turned to be slightly extreme, um, I think it, it has started from uh, the post-Iranian revolution in 1980s, where students from overseas coming back to Malaysia, especially from UK, from the United Kingdom, 
and they have close attachment with um, Ikhwanul Muslimin in Egypt and also some kind of influence from Jamaat Islami in Pakistan. And then, um, yeah, we used to be known as a liberal country, but nowadays Muslim has become conservative. Uh, they demand the government to become strict in applying Islamic teaching and practices. And uh, debates um, are mostly around the role of government and how they should um, really monitor uh, Muslim beliefs through legal regulation. So uh, this is part when um, how how law and policies impact badly on women. Uh, in 1984, uh, Malaysia's Islamic Family Law. Uh, was regarded as the most progressive Islamic family law in the Muslim world. But reform um, in 1994 and also in 2000, uh, 2005 have reversed many of the benefits for Muslim women. For example, uh, in 1994, the fifth condition uh, for polygamy, uh, not lowering the standard of living of the existing family was removed from the conditions and um, subsequently uh, a husband pronounces of talak I mean you pronounce divorce you pronounce talak to the wife outside the court was recognized previously um, divorce outside the court um, is not recognized it has to be done in front of the sharia judge and also over emphasis of wife no shows disobedient if the wife disagree with uh, the pronouncement of talak. Um, furthermore, in 2005, um, a husband can freeze and claim a share of matrimonial asset from the property of the wife. I mean, um, this is your wife belonging and then uh, you uh, throughout your marriage life, I'm sure your wife um, would um, earn some kind of good living and then she wants to own her own asset. But due to a regress amendment in the law, the husband can also claim part, part of the property from the wife. Uh, fasah. fasah is actually a um, pronouncement of talak through uh, legal procedure. I mean, it is initiated by the wife. I mean, wife will uh, file a divorce application in front of the Sharia judge, and then Sharia judge will consider whether uh, the fasa, the the application for fasa, the for the divorce initiated by the wife is allowed or not. But now fasa is also extended to husband. Instead of having talak talak rights on the hand of the husband, now fasa, which is the rights of the wife, is also extended to the husband as well. If the husband uh, is allowed for um, fasa, meaning that the husband uh, doesn't have to pay maintenance or alimony to the wife, I mean the idda uh, maintenance or the mutah, uh, the husband can run away from that responsibility. Um, <coughs> furthermore, the another condition uh, prior to polygamy, whether the, polyg the polygamous marriage should be just and necessary. I mean, the husband should fulfill the two conditions, whether the marriage should, is just and whether the marriage is necessary, was changed to just or necessary, meaning that the husband can uh, run away. I mean, the husband has to fulfill one condition only. Uh, if the husband say, uh, I want to legitimize my love to my girlfriend, and then the uh, judge feels that... Uh, yeah, the marriage is not necessary, then it will not happen. But now it has been changed to just or necessary. Okay, um, another trends in law reform. These are some of the discriminations against Muslim women in Malaysia. Um, women of other faith, um, because uh, I mentioned earlier that Malaysia runs on the dual legal system. For non-Muslim, they have uh, civil law, and for Muslim, uh, it, it is all governed under the Sharia law. So, Muslim um, women from the other faith, I mean, non-Muslim women has more right um, 
in terms of um, equal rights for marriage and divorce. I mean, they can uh, initiate um, divorce as well uh, through the at the civil court, and also for Muslim, for non-Muslim, uh, only monogamy is allowed. No polygamy for non-Muslim in Malaysia. Uh, for the Guardian Act, I mean that both parents have the right for the guardianship of the children, and also for the distribution distribution act as well. I mean. Um, this is something to do with your property, your belonging upon divorce, uh, your property will be divided equally. For, unlike for Muslim women, um, a wife has no equal right for divorce and polygamy. For, and polygamy is still allowed in Malaysia. Uh, it will not be banned in Malaysia, but we are hoping the enforcement and the law is tightened to really curb um, illegal polygamy. They always want to go to the southern Thai to make it easier. And guardianship only goes to the father, although the father has been missing for 20 years at least and never been in contact with the daughter. But when the daughter wants to get married, um, the Sharia judge will ask the daughter to find the father in order to become wali. But uh, we feel that it doesn't make sense. Your father has been missing for 20 years and suddenly you want your father to become your wali. And inheritance law is biased towards the son. Um, always want to refer to Farah rules. You know how Farah rules, I mean the son will get um, half and then the daughter will get only one fourth, one third and later on the wife gets only one eighth from the property. So um, what we do insist, we have um, a free legal advisory service and we give free legal advice uh, on the issue of Islamic family law and also Sharia Criminal Offences Act. What is Sharia Criminal Offences Act? Uh, Sharia Criminal Offences Act um, is a kind of um, a tool where government use the law to really uh, safeguard to protect your morality and your behavior. I mean, for example, um, if you have your boyfriend always coming to your house and then your neighbor is so nosy, calling uh, the religious authority, you might be liable for arrest and being being charged for an offense. So basically. <laughs> Uh, it is a kind of uh, your personal sin with with you and God, but the state wants to really intervene in your morality. <laughs> uh, the legal service has been established in 2003 and we have helped more than 10,000 clients. Um, our clients um, come, they are men, women, uh, local and foreigners as well and um, this is um, the charge uh, here uh, based on the findings that we have compiled and uh, you can see the top 10 at uh, the top four reason for the marriage breakdown and you can see the reasons are keep on recurring recurring from one year from one year to another year Uh, child marriage, um, it is allowed and legal in Malaysia, it is, and in 2014, uh, UNFPA has reported about 15,000 girls were married in Malaysia, and uh, in 2020, uh, 65.2 application for child marriage were approved, and as I mentioned in Malaysia, we have a, a 13 state and only one state has increased the minimum of marriage to 18. And among the 10 Southeast Asia, only Malaysia and Brunei has yet to increase the minimum of minimum age of marriage to 18 at least. But some other countries such as Indonesia, they have uh, increased the minimum age of marriage to 19. Uh, but we feel that, yes, uh, legal reform is needed, but raising awareness to the public, to the community has come, should be, should come hands in 
hands as well so that the, so the society are ready to really um, stop this practice. Okay, we have female genital mutilation or cutting, FGMC, we call it. Um, <coughs> there is a fatwa in 2009. Fatwa is a religious decree by the religious authority saying that uh, FGMC is wajib in Malaysia. And true enough, um, the prevalence is 93% of the Muslim girls has been cut in Malaysia. Uh, what, uh, according to the WHO definition, um, what Malaysia is practicing is type 1 and type 4. Type 1 is where uh, some kind of skin uh, has been cut from the genitalia. And also type 4 is uh, any other procedure that is uh, non-medical such as uh, nicking, pricking, um, burning, it is just to fulfill the cultural um, requirement. And 82% said it was done for religious obligation, but it is, but was it true? Because there is not a single verse in the Quran as saying that female circumcision should be done, not even male circumcision. What they refer to was um, hadith. <laughs> which can be um, really hadiths that are questionable, the authenticity. Um, we have the problem with the terminology as well, because uh, the authority keep on saying that what we are practicing is not FGMC, but we call it female circumcision. But female circumcision also falls under FGMC definition by the WHO. So therefore, the practice is harmless and with no to little complication. So we, we did um, a dialogue with the Ministry of Health and they mentioned that they have met the religious authority three times to revive the fatwa, to review the fatwa. But unfortunately, the fatwa still stays. So in 2020, to 2021, CIS has conducted uh, eight focus group discussion with parents across Malaysia just to find out their understanding and their perception about female circumcision. And among the interesting findings, um, there is one, um, because we do it with, uh, we also do it with uh, the grassroots community as well. We ask their opinion. So, this um, some of the answer given by the practitioner. Uh, she feels that female circumcision is good for cleanliness, and when the skin is removed, it will make the urination urination easier and prevent urine blockage. I couldn't I couldn't really imagine how how she can give this kind of logic, but it is up to her. Uh, she also believes that some people feel that non-circumcised girls are more aggressive. Yeah, all the myth <laughs> around female circumcision. And sadly, uh, instead of the traditional midwife, now there are more doctors uh, performing female circumcision. And it is part of the maternity package as well. Um, why why we, we are against of this practice? Because first, there is no religious ordain about female circumcision and there is no medical benefit behind female circumcision. So, why do you need to touch our, our girl's genitalia? We don't know. <laughs> so, uh, there is act of vigilantism. Vigilantism is where you take uh, the law on your own hand the law at your own hand and then you try to punish uh, the offenders uh, based on your understanding. So I think uh, just recent Ramadan, uh, there's a lot of um, stories being shared on the social media when women uh, were shamed and famed by the restaurant for not um, fasting during the fasting month. And then... Um, 
because uh, not fasting uh, during Ramadan is considered one of the offense under the Sharia Criminal Act offenses. So you are liable for being arrested and charged with the penalty as well. And also, uh, female students were sharing their stories about period spot check happening in the school. This is when um, the teachers want to ensure that you are really menstruating so that you can skip your solah and fasting as well. So therefore, they need to ensure you by checking whether you are really menstruating or not. Um, this is a form of sexual harassment among the girls and um, yeah, Sisters in Islam and uh, other women's rights organizations um, wrote to the Ministry of Education uh, asking their accountability of this. And also, a um, 17 year old, old girl student called her teacher on a rape and sexual harassment joke via TikTok. And unfortunately, she received a rape threat from her classmate and it has led to a campaign make a school a safer place. I mean, uh, can you imagine if your teacher at your school make a rape joke uh, on your girls? Well, surely you would be very furious about that. <coughs> oh, <coughs> So there is a fatwa against sisters in Islam because we are so vocal and we try to preach uh, Islam which is compassionate which is merciful, which is uh, not really in line with Islam uh, as what has been portrayed uh, mainstream on the media. So when they cannot debate with us, they use the scare tactic. I mean, using fatwa, using legal, legal mechanism to ban us from talking, from continuing our work. So uh, I would like to share the chronology. Uh, we have been fighting since 2014 until now. Uh, and we are tired going, going back and forth to the court. But it has to be done. Sorry, three minutes left. Okay. It has to be done. Um, but uh, it doesn't make us uh, stop from continuing our work. Um, yeah, as you can see, uh, the, the, the argument whether we should uh, contest the fatwa at the Sharia court or at the civil court. And this is the issue until now. So the next hearing is in September 2022. Uh, we have about five or six months to prepare ourselves. So uh, the way forward, uh, I can say, I can safely say as a Malaysian, Malaysia is not a moderate Muslim country as the way it is promoted at the international platform. It is not. And uh, young people are more conservative now. They want the government to regulate our behavior and our belief. And what we can do is we cease will continue with our planned activities by lobbying the MPs, meet the religious authorities. Uh, we want to raise awareness and also uh, we want to keep rocking the boat. Uh, no one wants to rock the boat if your life is at stake. But it should be done with calculated risks and strategies as well. So lastly, uh, please follow us on our social media. Uh, please um, download our publication. I brought some of our publication here. Maybe, I don't know whether they are still available, but you can go and download our publication from our website. They are free. Okay. Thank you.